Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the third meeting of the committee for 2019. Can I ask that everyone ensures that all mobile devices are switched to silent, please? Agenda item one is a decision to take agenda item three in private. Has everyone agreed? Agreed. agreed. Um, the first item on our agenda, um, pardon me, sorry, item two is first day of our stage two consideration of the Age of Criminal Responsibility Scotland Bill. They will go no further than part three of the bill today. Can I welcome Marie Todd, Minister for Children and Young People, um, and her officials this morning. You're very welcome. Okay, so for section one, can I call amendment two in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, grouped with, amendment, with amendments as shown in the groupings. At this point, I would advise members that amendments two and one are direct alternatives. I would also draw members' attention to the information in the groupings on the other direct alternatives in this group. Direct alternatives are two or more amendments seeking to replace the same text in a bill with alternative approaches. In this case, Amendment 2 proposes to replace 12 with 14, and Amendment 1 proposes replacing 12 with 16. A vote will be taken on both amendments in the order in which they appear on the marshalled list. If both the first and second amendments were to be agreed, then the second amendment succeeds the former, and the first amendment would cease to have effect. Alec Cole Hamilton to move Amendment 2 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you very much, Convener. Good morning, Minister. Um, I've rather a lot to say, uh, but members will realise that the amendments in this group represent the fault line in this legislation. So they will, I hope, forgive me for taking time to unpack and deploy my arguments here. Before I address the more technical amendments, I want to speak to the overall proposition of seeking to lift the minimum age of criminal responsibility uh, to 14 and 16, respectively, as set out in Amendments 2 and 1 in my name, and all interconnected amendments in this group. The evidence we have taken throughout Stage 1, and indeed in the foothills of Stage 2, has been characterised by some very public and unprecedented interventions by the international community, expressing an imperative for us to go further than 12, at least to 14, and arguably further still to 16. This was a view shared by the clear majority of witnesses who gave evidence to this committee. The very day after our Stage 1 debate, the Children's Commissioner Bruce Adamson shared with our committee the intent of the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child to revise General Comment 10, issued in 2012, benchmarking the absolute minimum ACR at 12. It was confirmed to Member States yesterday that the UN will uplift that baseline to 14 in the coming days. This was reinforced by Professor Anne Skelton, who gave us evidence to the committee from the United Nations a fortnight ago when she said, the committee proposes a new revision that 14 should be considered the minimum age. She went on to say, to complete its well-respected system, Scotland should ensure that it conforms with international standards. This was not the only intervention in our deliberations. The Human Rights Commissioner of the European Council, Dunja Majotovic, wrote to the Minister expressing in the strongest terms that the view of the European Council that Scotland should seize this legislative opportunity to meet the minimum standards of international expectation and set at the very least a minimum of 14. Minister, your response to the Commissioner was nothing short of a national embarrassment. You sought to lean on what I believe to, sense, uh, to, to lean on a sense of perceived exceptionalism. You inferred to the Commissioner that the unique and welfareist approach to youth justice offered by our children's hearing system should absolve us of the need to meet the de minimis standards of international expectation. Now, I make no denigration of the hearing system of which we have much to be justifiably proud. It is held up as an exemplar in the world, but convener, when it comes to international minimums, we don't get a pass. I'm, I too am proud of the fact that since Kilbrandon was first published in 1971, we've adopted a welfareist approach to harmful behavior in our children, but when it comes to international minimums, we don't get a pass. And whilst this government is at last using the word love in the narrative arc around the policy it creates for children and young people, when it comes to international minimums, we don't get a pass. This was summed up quite starkly in the Commissioner's reply, in which she said, I appreciate the Minister's comprehensive explanation of those differences and the positive elements of the Scottish approach. Many of these are considered good examples in Europe. However, I also note 
that many different approaches are applied across the 47 member states of the Council of Europe, making each national system unique with specific advantages and challenges. It is important to underscore that international human rights standards, such as those referred to in my letter to the Minister, are developed precisely to provide minimum safeguards, regardless of the diversity of states' laws, policies and practices. So I ask the Minister that any further attempt the Government may make to attempt to justify sticking at 12 in this Bill, that they dispense with that line of argument. It only serves to compound that embarrassment still further. Last week, my party leader, Willie Rennie, asked the First Minister at First Minister's question time for movement on this issue and to meet the new international minimum, to which the First Minister argued, as I'm sure the Minister may also of the need to carry the population with us. She rightly pointed out that the original consultation prior to stage one, 88% of respondents supported an uplift to 12. But convener, if you ask a binary question, you will get a binary answer. And an uplift to 12 was all that respondents, and for that matter, the working group that preceded it, were asked to offer a view on. As such, I'm grateful, grateful for the forbearance of Clarks and my fellow committee members in agreeing in the light of those international interventions to reopen our consideration of evidence to consider an uplift of 14 and 16 respectively, as contained in my amendments in this group. Convener, as you know, the written responses to that call of evidence uh, showed a desire of 86% of res written respondents to go to at least 14, with most wanting to go to 16. Of particular interest was the response of Children's Hearing Scotland, who said that they stood ready to implement any age that this parliament arrived at, but we should endeavour to go further. So, Minister, I would say to you that if your government wishes to carry the, those interested in this issue with us on a journey to further increase, then they are already here. The point the First Minister um, used to justify sticking at 12 was on a point of capacity. She said there are not just issues of principle, but practical issues in terms of the sheer volume of cases that would be affected by that decision. That was in direct questioning by Willie Rennie on an uplift to 14. Convener, every member of this committee received the very helpful correspondence of the Lord Advocate last week, breaking down the statistics that make up that sheer volume of cases to which the First Minister refers. Of offences reported uh, among those aged 12 and 13 last year, 27 cases were referred to the Procurator Fiscal for criminal proceedings. Of those, only 11 went to court. Understanding these numbers is very important for gauging the magnitude of the task before us and seeking further uplift. But I would put it to the committee that 11 is not a sheer volume, it's barely a handful. Nevertheless, moving to 14 would require careful consideration about how these cases could be dealt with within the children's hearing system. I accept that, and work does need to be done. The Scottish Children's Reporter, who incidentally also support an uplift to 16, has explained in granular detail the kind of consideration we would need to take around these cases. They, there might need to be a consideration of extending post-18 powers to the panel or introducing a higher burden of proof going beyond the balance of probabilities in the most egregious case, cases. This was a view reflected by the Lord Advocate himself, that he would not himself, he said, set his face against further uplift, but further careful consideration about the handful of cases which went to court would be needed. Convener, the Scottish Government have suggested that the work described by the Lord Advocate is too vast to contemplate in the context of any further progress in this bill. I'm sorry, but I just can't accept that. This is a Parliament which passed the European Continuity Act in three days, readying every aspect of the powers of this Parliament against the impact of Brexit. So I ask, does the government really expect this committee, relevant stakeholders, and the general public to believe that we can't work out to do what to do with 11 kids in two years? After ascertaining from stakeholders just how long might be needed, I brought forward Amendment 65 to 69 and 77 to 81 in my name 
to offer Parliament a sunrise clause to attain a new age of criminal responsibility of 12 on royal assent, but with a further uplift of 14 or 16, 18 months later, either automatically or following a vote <coughs> in Parliament. Amendment 72, also in my name, would allow provision for re the re-establishment of a working group to undertake this task with ministers duty bound to bring any recommendation for further uplift to a vote in Parliament no later than 31st of January 2021. Where there is a will, there is a way. Aside from the international embarrassment of trying to argue for exemption from the new international minimum, there is scope here for domestic embarrassment as well. Before I came to this place, I was proud to serve on the leadership panel of Scotland's National Action Plan for Human Rights under Sir Alan Miller. I was heartened, therefore, when he was appointed to head up the First Minister's Advisory Group on Human Rights Leadership. He and his colleagues put in a great deal of effort to equip Scotland to act as a human rights leader on the global stage. Now, at a stroke, by refusing to move to the international, with the international community to embrace the new international minimum in this vital area of human rights, we have hauled below the waterline any credibility we may have had as a human rights champion internationally. Put simply, we have wasted the time of a good man and those around him. By way of example, we often sit in judgment over human rights issues in China and Russia, but both of these countries already have higher ages of criminal responsibility than we do or like look set to. As Willie Rennie said last week on human rights, you can't lead the world from the back of the pack. So if we don't achieve movement in this bill, then I will no longer be able to stomach self-congratulatory posturing of this government in the subject of human rights. It just won't wash anymore. Convener, I don't have a great deal more to say, but I will say a word on my amendments to lift the age of prosecution and my amendment to lift it to 16. The age of criminal prosecution was a bellwether for the moves to lift the age of criminal responsibility in this act. When we answered the call in 2012, the United Nations to lift uh, our criminal responsibility age to 12, we eventually got our criminal prosecution as that leader uh, clause to bring us there eventually. So if at the very least, if none of my other amendments pass, then let us look to increase the age of criminal prosecution, again as a signal to the international community of intent, and so that nobody under the age of 16 should be criminalized. In terms of my amendment to lift the age to 16, I have made great story on why we need to get to 14, but it's important to state why I've placed this amendment to get to 16. I want to move the Overton window of debate around this subject. And during our stage one debate, I intervened on Liam Kerr. He had been stating that at 12, children have full capacity to make value judgments and understand the consequences of their action. I asked him, therefore, if he agreed that as such we should reduce the voting age to 12. He looked horrified. That's just it. 16 is the age that this country has accepted as an age of majority at which adult responsibilities are conferred. We credit young people at that age with the maturity to decide whether to leave home, if they want to marry, whether to have sex, and now who they want to run the country. There is widespread opposition to lowering this age for any of these things because many feel that children before that age lack maturity, but still they believe criminal capacity develops far earlier. This is incongruous. I can't reconcile that disparity. Either you have maturity and judgment or you do not in the eyes of the law. I'll finish with this. All of my amendments were dra drafted with Lindsay Hanvidge in mind. Every member in this room was moved and has cited uh, Lindsay's testimony that at the age of 13, she was arrested for kicking off on the night that she was be to be taken into care. She spent a night in the cells with all the trauma that that brings. Put simply, in the middle of one adverse childhood experience, this state handed her another. Convener, nothing about the government's bill as it currently stands would have changed anything whatsoever about Lindsay's story. If we don't change the bill, then we shall have failed her and those like her. I move the amendments in my name. Can I invite other members who wish to speak to indicate? Maybe Fee. Thank you, um, Convener. Can I say at the outset that I support all of um, Alex Cole Hamilton's amendments? And much of what um, I would want to say has already been said by my colleague. However, some of it is worth um, repeating. Alex Cole Hamilton is right when he says that the amendments that he has lodged today are the fault line in this legislation, they are. 
all of the evidence that we have had has supported raising the age of criminal responsibility higher than 12. The revision to General Comment 10 to raise the minimum to 14 should be a recommendation that we embrace, not a recommendation that we choose to avoid by um, saying that we almost deserve a pass because we have the children's hearing system. The children's hearing system is something that we should be proud of, um, and we are proud of it, but it is not something that gives us a pass to incorporating um, guidance and legislation that comes from um, the UN. And we speak a lot in this, in this place about incorporation of the United Nations Convention on the right, Rights of the Child. This legislation is an opportunity for us to um, take a further step along that path of incorporation. And the fact that we choose to pull back from that is, as Alex Cole Hamilton has said, a national embarrassment. And it is something that should shame us all. And I would urge my fellow committee members to support the amendments in the name of Alex Cole Hamilton. Oliver Mundell. Thank you, uh, Convener. Uh, we remain of the view that 12 strikes the right balance um, and whilst we're sympathetic to some of the evidence and arguments that have been made, uh, that remains our position. Uh, we are, however, um, concerned or, or, or sympathetic to the argument made around exceptionalism. I think it's better uh, to be straightforward, um, as we've tried to be, um, and recognise that neither the system uh, nor the people living in our country are ready to um, see the age move beyond 12. Um, and I would highlight that not all evidence that we've heard uh, does support uh, going beyond 12 and would point in particular uh, to the further submission from Victim Support Scotland uh, that said that they didn't support uh, that changing at this time. Thank you. Okay. Kill Ross. Thank you, Convener. Um, and I would like to um, put on record that I also agree that I don't think that 12 should be the age that we stick at. I agree that we need to go further and we did have a lot of evidence to say that we need to go further. I don't believe we should be criminalising children and I seek assurances from the Minister that work will be done, is being done, uh, to move us beyond 12. Um, and I find it unfortunate that that work hasn't been done at this point, but I would like to hear um, what we are doing to, to get beyond 12. Um, I believe that if we vote for these amendments today to go straight to 14 and 16 or 16, that the work that needs to be done to get us there would mean that we stick at eight for longer than we need to. And I don't think that that's a responsible position for us to take. Absolutely. I'm grateful to the member for taking intervention. That is um, absolutely why my Sunrise Clause amendments uh, cover that. I think the children's report have made a very strong point about that and said we can't delay any further. That is why uh, my amendments around the Sunrise Clause would see on royal assent automatic um, uplift to 12 as agreed by this committee and then further uplift 18 months later giving a uh, working group or whoever's charged with the task of doing the work to make this happen uh, the time to get everything in place for a, an automatic uplift to 14 or 16 depending what the committee agrees 18 months later. Um, I thank Alec Hamilton for that intervention and that clarification um, of the amendment. I also find it difficult to put in legislation an automatic uplift when we don't know what the group is going to come back with. Um, therefore, um, it is with a heavy heart that I will not be supporting these amendments today. Fulton McGregor. Um, and, and very similar actually to, to Gail Ross's approach, I've got a lot of sympathy uh, with Alex Cole Hamilton's uh, amendments here. Um, you know, I, I think that that we do need to be moving in a direction towards at least 14. I don't agree necessarily with the, all of the tone uh, of Alex's um, uh, speech. Speech there, I think um, some of the language um, about embarrassment. There's, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't think at all. Somebody that worked in the children's hearing system for a very long time, I think that it's it's far uh, from embarrassing. Yeah, I, 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 okay. 
I'm grateful to the member for <coughs> offering me the opportunity to clarify. At no point did I suggest our children's hearing system was a source of embarrassment. Uh, the minister's reply to the Commissioner of the Council of Europe on human, in terms of the Human Rights Commissioner was a national embarrassment. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Just to clarify, I, I, know, that, I know that you didn't express that about the children's hearing system, but <coughs> you did use the language of embarrassment several times, so I was just stressing that I think that yeah, the, the hearing system is a credit uh, to Scotland. I think that the amendments themselves um, have, the, as, as Gail Ross highlighted, have the potential to um, be irresponsible. And while maybe not wrecking the bill, they are certainly, in my mind, uh, reckless because they do um, they do put the uh, they do keep the age at eight. And I know you talked there about the sunrise clause, but we don't know what, the, what any future group would come up with. We don't know what government would be in place. We don't we don't know what referendums may happen. Um, and what's going to happen with Brexit over the next week? while. so it's too. I, I'm, ju I'm just going to finish just now. Um, it's too big a risk for me to take to not move this to 12, which is where the work's been at. And if the, uh, the committee would excuse my voice, I've got a bit of cold this morning. So I will leave it at that, Kevina. Okay, uh, Minister. I just Thank you. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank the committee for taking additional evidence at stage two to inform the consideration of these, uh, this group of amendments. That evidence highlighted that this is a very complex issue that needs to be considered fully within the context of our wider approach to supporting young people's harmful behaviour. We can rightly be proud that this Parliament universally supported the principle of raising the age of criminal responsibility, but we shouldn't forget the work that's been undertaken to arrive here, nor that this work involved a long and considered collaborative approach with agencies, professionals and, crucially, also engaged children and young people. And that's enabled us to reach a consensus that the age of criminal responsibility in Scotland should be raised. If we are to take forward any further proposals, we require a similar considered approach of all of the implications and potential impacts of doing so. And while raising the age is clearly important, as the First Minister pointed out last week, how we deal with young people in the system overall, I believe, is what is really important. One of the things I took from the full range of remarks and recommendations in the draft UN General Comment number 24 on children's rights in the justice system is that we already are doing or going further than some of what the UNCRC is calling on states to do. It's important that we don't lose sight of our track record on this whole area. Only yesterday, statistics were published which show that the number of young people convicted of a crime or an offence has fallen by two-thirds to the lowest level in 10 years. So in Scotland, we already recognise and share a belief across all parties that heavy-handed or retributive criminal justice is counterproductive for children and for young people. The vast majority of children aged 12 to 15 who offend are already dealt with by our welfare-based children's hearing system rather than being prosecuted in court. Now, clearly, the UN call for states to consider a higher minimum age of criminal responsibility is an important development. The Scottish Government will carefully consider this general comment in its entirety and will assess what future reforms might be needed as a result. But I have two significant concerns in relation to increasing the age of criminal responsibility through this bill. The first relates to our readiness to raise the age of responsibility or prosecution beyond 12, with key issues highlighted by the law officers in their evidence. As the Lord Advocate made clear, raising the age further requires us to be satisfied that the bill has the right systems and safeguards to respond to the full range of possible cases, which statistics show are greater in volume, challenge and complexity. It's my firm belief that we should be sure on these issues, not least in terms of the duty of care that we owe to young people who engage in harmful behaviour and victims of harmful behaviour. That's one of our key responsibilities as legislators. The Lord Advocate highlighted the state's positive obligations under international law to maintain an effective system for the investigation of crime and securing the rights of victims. Now, with this bill, we can be reassured that any incident involving a child under 12 can be investigated properly, any victim respected and responded to, and that children can be properly supported without being criminalised. The Lord Advocate and the Solicitor General demonstrated 
how we would not have that reassurance should we move to raise the age further now. There are significant numbers of serious offences which are currently not responded to in the children's hearing system and couldn't be without further primary legislation. There are additional concerns regarding complex issues such as delayed reporting of grave historic offences by children against other younger children. In raising the age of criminal responsibility, we must have confidence that we have appropriate measures and mechanisms in place to address children's behaviour and to support them with appropriate interventions. For children under 12, we do. But since 2011-12, 1,285 12 and 13-year-olds were involved in incidents that were reported to the Procurator Fiscal, including charges of murder and rape. Some of those cases retained in the criminal justice system resulted in disposals that go beyond a child's 18th birthday. That would not possibly be possible currently in the children's hearing system and primary legislation is required to extend the jurisdiction of the hearing system to include all young people aged 16 and 17 and to provide for interventions beyond a young person's 18th birthday if the age of prosecution or criminal responsibility is raised further. Yes, certainly. To the Minister for giving way. I, I recognise the statistics that she uh, and she has just given the committee, but she also recognises that if you take that on a yearly basis, the number of cases referred to the Procurator to FISL, which actually go to trial, a uh, number less than a dozen, um, that, that isn't a capacity issue that is insurmountable. And yes, whilst there's primary legislation that required, we could pass amendments within this bill who, which could empower the government by regulation to extend those powers to the panel that she describes. I, um, I, I believe that these primary legislation changes are so substantial that they should be primary legislation, that they should be um, subject to the normal procedures and consultation that's required. I don't believe it. I think this issue is so substantial, I don't think it should be amended by regulation. Legislative change would have to be supported by practice change for decision makers and for professionals implementing new measures. And that was made very clear, as a number of you have mentioned, by Malcolm Schaefer, the, children's, the Scottish Children's Reporter Administration, and representatives of the National Youth Justice Advisory Group also highlighted their concern about services' capacity to address the full range of harmful behaviour of 12 and 13-year-olds if the age were to raise to 14 immediately. And of course, there are likely to be operational and implementational issues to be addressed that are not yet clear to us. We simply must be able to answer the hardest questions and to provide for all eventualities. To do so takes time. And just as we gave the original advisory group time it needed to arrive at the recommendations which informed the measures of that bill, I'm acutely aware that the young people who offend have often been the victims of harmful behaviour, abuse, neglect, violence, often from a young age, and therefore are also in need of care and protection themselves. And for this reason, I understand the calls to increase the age further. And I have also said throughout this bill process that I will listen and consider the evidence. But that evidence suggests that we should not increase the age of criminal responsibility or prosecution beyond 12 without being confident that our laws, systems, services <coughs> and professionals are prepared and supported. They need to be ready and feel ready before we consider further change. I cannot, therefore, support the amendments to raise the age of criminal responsibility for the reasons I set out. I ask the member not to press them. If he does so, I ask for these amendments to be resisted. OK, I'll call Hamilton to wind up and press or withdraw your amendments. Thank you, convener. I sought membership of this committee because I have had a, a long career in human rights and I, I believe that this committee would be a force for good in the human rights landscape. But sometimes I just don't know what we're doing here. I really do not. Um, the minister in her remarks once again sought to lean on that sense of exceptionalism in terms of our children's hearing system and the strata that we employ to deal with young people who commit harmful behaviour. Um, but that just doesn't cut it with the international community. And she referenced um, the, 
the general comments of the United Nations Committee of the Rights of the Child. Well, we had a member of the Committee for the Rights of the Child give evidence to us two weeks ago, and Professor Anne Skelton said, although Scotland is to be commended for holding on to its welfarist approach, that does not mean that you are not obliged to take note of and comply with international regulations and standards. If a, an uplift of 14 is not a standard, I don't know what is. Now, we've talked also a lot in, in the other remarks made by fellow members and the minister herself about um, the work that needs to be done. That's entirely why I put in a Sunrise Clause amendment. We've interrogated with witnesses, including the Lord Advocate and the children's reporter, what amount of work would be required so that we could get to 12 immediately. Fulton McGregor suggested this, this would delay it. My amendment actually would ensure that the minimum age was immediately uplifted to 12 on uh, royal assent. And then within 18 months of that, we would get the work done and uh, rules in place to ensure that our systems were ready, as the minister describes. And through the affirmative procedure, we can give Parliament the scrutiny it requires of the primary legislation necessitated on things like an uplift to 18. Um, uh, increase of powers over 18. I will. Um, it's back to the, the sunrise, sunrise clause. I said in my uh, remarks as well that, you know, I'm sympathetic to want to move into 14. Obviously, that's where you're wanting to go. But do you not think that that's irresponsible of this committee to put into legislation, a, you know, a predetermined outcome? There are several iterations of the Sunrise Clause Amendment. You're, you're welcome to back whichever you please uh, the most, Fulton. I mean, in, in respect of that, um, the, there is an option within a number of my amendments to give Parliament a vote on whether we do go ahead with that uplift. And 72, and most importantly, I think, it um, demands that ministers bring back the recommendations of a reconvened working group to that end. So there is a, a potpourri of amendments, if you like, Mr. McGregor, that, that would assuage any anxiety you have on that score, and that's exactly why I laid them. Can we... I will. So can I address the sunrise mechanisms in particular? The issue of requiring more time to consider all of the implications and bring forward the appropriate le primary legislation is my second concern about this. Um, your amendments 80 to 81, until we've provided the answers fully and considered the matters fully, the age of criminal responsibility stays as it is. So we need this idea of taking a stepped approach is attractive, but 18 months is just not sufficient time to consider the approach we need, nor to bring forward any additional primary legislative changes highlighted in particular by the Lord Advocate and Mark Malcolm Schaefer. I think that by setting arbitrary time limits, there's a risk that we rush this and fail to address all of the matters that need to be considered. We need to take our time to get it right. We may not be in a position to commence these provisions, which again could keep us at a lower age for a longer time. None of us want that to happen. I come back to the proposition that this is a parliament which dealt with the EU continuity bill covering every aspect of devolved competency in three days. I can't, I can't believe it is beyond the capability of those involved in the working group, in the children's reporter, in the procurator fiscal to get round a table and over the course of two years, which it would be considering how far we are away from royal assent for this bill, to ascertain exactly what we would need to do with the 11 children that go to trial each year. And as far as I'm concerned, that's two areas of change that we would need, maybe post-18 powers for disposals by the children's panel, and indeed a change in the burden of proof beyond the balance of probabilities to beyond reasonable doubt in the most egregious cases. We've already had that thrashed out as the only two real changes that we might might be required. I cannot believe that takes two years to do if there is a political will behind it so to do. I don't believe that political will exist, sadly. Unamended convener, this bill is an embarrassment. The government has no cause to speak of it with pride. Only, I will only vote for this bill because the current age of criminal responsibility in Scotland is frankly medieval and this government has presided over that for the last decade. When I think of my amendments, I think of Lindsay Hanbridge, alone and in the dark. If we don't pass these amendments, then nothing about her story would have been different and we would have let her down. An amended this bill says to 12 to 15 year olds, this country will govern you with love until you break the law. And at that, that point, the love ends. 
Minister, the international community has already judged your government on this. If we don't amend this bill, so too will history. But more importantly than that, so will children and young people in this country. And I don't blame them. I wish to press my amendments. The question is that amendment two be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Then there will be a division. Can I ask those in favour of the amendment to raise their hands now? And those against? And there are no abstentions. The result of the division is for the amendments, two against the amendment, five the amendments, four. I call amendment one in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with amendment two, Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move. Move, convener. Um, the question is that amendment one be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Um, Parliament is not agreed, so there'll be a division. Can I ask those in favour of the amendment to raise their hands? And those against? The result of the division is two for the amendment, five against the amendment. The amendment falls. I now call Amendment 65 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 65 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Can I ask those in favour of the amendment to raise their hands? Those against the amendment? The result of the division is for the amendment two, against the amendment five, the amendment falls. The question is that section one be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. 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 Section one is agreed to. I call amendment 68 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with amendment two. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 68 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Can I ask those in favour of the amendment to raise their hands now? And those against the amendment? The result of the division is for the amendment two, against the amendment five, the amendment falls. I call amendment 66 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with amendment two, Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Moved. The question is that Amendment 66 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Can I ask those in favour of the amendment to raise their hand? And those against the amendment? <coughs> the result of the division is for the amendment to Against the amendment, five. The amendment falls. I call amendment 71 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with amendment two. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 71 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Can I ask those in favour of amendment to raise their hand? And those against?
The result of the division is for the amendment two, against the amendment five, the amendment falls. I call amendment 70 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with amendment two. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Moved. The question is that amendment 70 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? There will be a division. Can I ask those in favour of the amendment to raise their hands now? And those against? The result of the division is for the amendment two, against the amendment five, the amendment falls. I call amendment 72 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with amendment two. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Move. The question is that amendment 72 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No, there will be a division. Can I ask those in favour of the amendment to raise their hands now, please? And those against? The result of the division is for the amendment two, against the amendment five, the amendment falls. I call amendment four in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with amendment two. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 4 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? There will be a division. Can I ask those in favour of the amendment to raise their hands now? And those against? <coughs> the result of the division is for the Amendment 2. Against the amendment five, the amendment falls. I call amendment three in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with amendment two. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Move. The question is that amendment three be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No, there'll be a division. Can I ask those in favour of the amendment to raise their hands now, please? And those against the amendment? The result of the division is for the amendment two, against the amendment five, the amendment falls. I call amendment 69 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with amendment two. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? As it relates to amendment that's already fallen, I, I won't move. Okay. Call amendment 67 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with amendment two. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? For the same reason, convener not moved. Call amendment five in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with amendment two. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. The question is that section two is agreed to. Are we agreed? Agreed. Agreed. I call amendment seven in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with amendment two. At no. this point, I would like to remind members that amendments seven and six are direct alternatives. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 6 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. The question is that Section 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. agreed. Okay. I call Amendment 101 in the name of Oliver Mundell and a group on its own. Oliver Mundell to move and speak to Amendment 101. Thank you, convener. I, I move uh, the, the amendment and I uh, speak to it now. Uh, this amendment is designed uh, to give uh, added protection uh, to uh, society as a whole um, and recognises uh, the important role the Lord Advocate currently plays um, in providing a check and balance within the system. Uh, I believe that uh, that's a role he can continue to play and he should continue to take an interest in uh, harmful uh, behaviour for those between the age of 8 and 12 
uh, where uh, that behaviour um, does give uh, rise to wider public safety uh, concerns uh, or undermines the confidence of the justice system, uh, we think it would be wrong uh, to lose uh, his input and expertise, uh, particularly in difficult areas around uh, sexual offences and the loss of life. Um, and I'm interested uh, to hear what other members uh, have to say. Okay. Can I, any other members wish to come in? Alec Hamilton. Uh, thank you. And, and briefly, convener, um, so I'm grateful to Oliver Mandel for starting this debate. I, I cannot support this amendment. I think that there is enough about this bill which flies in the face of international expectation, and this, this would just go further into that. Um, we don't require um, the intervention of a Lord Advocate or equivalent in other nation states of the UN which have already adopted a higher age of criminal responsibility, I don't see why we should be exceptional in this case. So for that reason, I will oppose this amendment. Fulton McGregor. Yeah, I'd agree with uh, Alex Cole Hamilton here. I think that the last debate and the last group of amendments brought forward by Alex was around um, a, a timing issue and, and how we get to a certain point. I think that this uh, particular amendment um, would be retrograde to that, and I will also not be supporting it. Mary Fee. I, I will be um, very brief. I cannot um, support this amendment, and I agree with the comments that have been made by um, both of my um, colleagues. I think this amendment would be a, a retrograde step. Okay, Minister. Thank you. Um, whilst we all, all must have confidence in the changes being made through this bill, we need to be very careful not to reverse reforms already made in order to introduce unintended consequences in trying to create safeguards to address the most serious harmful behaviour that some children might engage in. This amendment would give powers to the Lord Advocate that currently do not exist on decision making in relation to children under 12. And it has the potential to bring a broad as yet unspecified range of under 12s into the ambit of the criminal justice system. It would undermine the role that the children's hearing system has had over this age group since the age of prosecution was increased in 2011. This amendment would therefore return this age group of children to the criminal justice system for the first time in seven years. We know that harmful behaviour involving primary school aged children is rare and seriously harmful behaviour is even rarer. Uh, we also know that at this age a disproportionate number of children involved in offending have faced severe disadvantage. Um, and adversity in early childhood and it's important that we make the welfare of these children the primary consideration and continue to deal with them exclusively under the children's hearing system. This bill seeks to fully decriminalise all primary school aged children. This amendment would undermine this approach and principle by creating a two-tier system in relation to some children in some circumstances by giving a new power to the head of the system of the criminal prosecution to consider their actions or behaviour. And that would seem to me, as Mary Fee has also said, a retrograde step, not least because of the implications for children's rights. I acknowledge that there may still be some instances of seriously harmful behaviour in the future by a very small number of primary school aged children that will require an appropriate and serious response. This bill seeks to create measures which will allow such a behaviour to be investigated and addressed. This amendment would cut across those provisions and create an unhelpful innovation to our long-standing approach epitomised by the children's hearing system. I therefore would hope that Mr Mundell will not press his amendment. If he does, I would strongly urge the committee to resist it. Oliver Mundell. Thank you, uh, convener. I believe that this amendment is drafted in such a way as only to capture a very small number of individuals in extremely exceptional circumstances. It, it respects the fact uh, that those children would no longer be treated uh, as having committed uh, criminal acts under uh, section uh, one. Um, it does, however, uh, provide uh, some uh, reassurance uh, for those people who are victims. Um, and uh, I think uh, it, it is a fair balance. I have a great deal of faith in the independent and important role uh, the Lord Advocate has played um, in uh, the Scottish legal system. Um, and I, I think uh, we could uh, respect uh, the individual office holder to take uh, the right decisions in uh, the public interest and I therefore press uh, the amendment. 
The question is that Amendment 101 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The committee is not agreed, um, so there will be a division. Can I ask those in favour of the amendment to raise their hands? And those against the amendment? The result of the division is for the amendment two, against the amendment five, the amendment falls. We'll now suspend briefly to allow officials to change places. Welcome back. I now call Amendment 9 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 8 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 11 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. And at this point, Point. I would like to remind members that amendments 11 and 10 are direct alternatives. Not move, convener. Okay. Cool. Call amendment 10 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? And not moved. I call amendment 82 in the name of the minister, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Minister to move amendment 82 and to speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you. Um, the policy intention in the di disclosure sections of the bill is that no person should have to disclose any information about pre-12 behaviour unless the independent reviewer has determined that it should be disclosed by the state. The bill as it stands doesn't fully provide for this and the amendments put in place um, improve protections for those uh, subject to disclosure. Amendments 82 to 89 relate to state disclosure by Disclosure Scotland and how that interacts with the duty to self-disclose um, or acknowledge pre-12 behaviour where a disclosure check is used, for example, in connection with the recruitment to a job. The substantive amendments 84 to 87 put in place the important protection against the need to self-disclose relevant behaviour in any ancillary circumstances. They replace the protection being removed by amendment 83. This is a positive step which brings the protection into the same piece of legislation in this bill as the provisions establishing the position of the independent reviewer. The technical amendments 88, 89 and 96 to 98 are consequential on the substantive. Taken together, they'll deliver benefits to the individuals and allow them to move on from their childhood behaviour. I would urge the committee members to support them. If the members wish me to discuss the detail of the amendments, I'm happy to do so. Any other member wish to come in? Alec Cole Hamilton. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I'm not clear how this does increase the protections of those subject to disclosure. In fact, discussion with uh, stakeholders um, in the voluntary sector in the human rights landscape are, are mildly concerned by these amendments. This is actually uh, backsliding and, and will actually create situations where more information is revealed than perhaps the original bill uh, would have allowed. And for that purpose, uh, for that reason, Convener, I can't support these amendments. Any other members wish to come in? Minister, do you wish to wind up? So, essentially, because pre-12 harmful behaviour is no longer considered an offence, um, it's no longer protected by the 1974 Rehabilitation of Offenders Act. So these amendments rebuild those protections and in fact go further than those protections. They also align the duty to self-disclose or not self-disclose, um, for example, during an application for a, for a job. Um, I think they are very important um, protections against the need to self-disclose relevant behaviour and any ancillary uh, circumstances. And it's a positive step which brings the protection um, all into the same piece of legislation um, as the uh, position of the independent reviewer. And I would urge the committee members to support them. The question is that Amendment 82 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Uh, the committee is not agreed, so there will be a division. Can I ask those in favour of the amendment to raise their hands now, please? 
and those against the amendment. The result of the division is for the Amendment 5, against the Amendment 2. The amendment passes. I call Amendments 83, 84, 85, 86 and 87 all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated and invite the Minister to move Amendments 83 to 87 on block. Moved. Can I ask if any member objects to a single question being put on Amendments 83 to 87? Um, the question is that amendments 83 to 87 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. no. There'll be a division. Can I ask those in favour of amendments 83 to 87 to raise their hands now, please? And those against? The result of the division is for the amendment five, against the amendments two, the amendments pass. <clears throat> Call amendment 13 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with amendment two. At this point, I would like to remind members that amendments 13 and 12 are direct alternatives. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not move. Call Amendment 12 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton. Um, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not move. I call Amendment 88 in the name of the Minister. Already debated with Amendment 82. Minister to formally move. Moved. The question is that Amendment 88 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. no the committee is not agreed, so there will be a division. Can I ask those in favour of Amendment 88 to raise their hands, please? Those against the amendment? The results of the division are for the amendment five, against the amendment two, the amendment passes. Call amendment 89 in the name of the minister, already debated with amendment 82. Minister to move formally. Moved. The question is that amendment 89 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Committee's not agreed, there'll be a division. Can I ask those in favour of the amendment to raise their hands, please? Those against the amendment? The result of the division is for the amendment five, against the amendment two, the amendment carries. Call Amendment 15 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 14 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. The question is that Section 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 17 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not move. I call Amendment 16 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. The question is that Section 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Call Amendment 90 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 91, 92, 93 and 94. Minister to move Amendment 90 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you. Um, these amendments have been lodged in response to feedback received from stakeholders and to ensure that the terms and conditions of the independent reviewer are sufficiently clear in the bill. I hope that these amendments also assure the committee and wider stakeholders that there's nothing in the bill that gives Scottish ministers, the chief constable or anyone else any power to direct the independent reviewer in the exercising of their functions. 
Amendment 90 and 91 amend the period of appointment provided for in Section 7, Subsection 1, so that it's fixed at three years. This makes clear the definitive nature of the appointment and removes any uncertainty in the ex that the existing wording might have caused. Amendment 92 adds the word conditions to Section 7.2 to reflect that a person is to be appointed as independent reviewer on such terms and conditions as the Scottish ministers determine. In line with similar provisions in other acts, I can confirm that the usual public appointment rules and therefore terms and conditions which apply to other such appointments will apply. Amendment 93 outlines specific circumstances under which a person is disqualified from appointment or holding office as an independent reviewer. It provides that elected politicians cannot be appointed as an independent reviewer. If the independent reviewer becomes an elected politician, they are automatically disqualified. Section 7, subsection 6 of the Bill as introduced provides that Scottish Ministers may terminate appointment of the independent reviewer. Amendment 94 removes subsection 6 and replaces it with details of the specific circumstances under which Ministers may remove a person from office and how this can be done. The aim is to make clear the limits of ministerial powers in this regard and I hope that the Committee agree these amendments provide welcome clarification and certainly in relation to the measures setting out how the independent reviewer is intended to operate and will support them. Do any members wish to speak to these amendments? Minister, do you need to wind up? Uh, no, I certainly would encourage the committee members to support amendments 19 to 94. The question is that amendment 90 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call amendments 91, 92, 93 and 94, all in the name of the Minister, all previously debated. I invite the Minister to move amendments 91 to 94 on block. Moved. Do any members object to a single question being put on these amendments? No. The question is that amendments 91 to 94 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. The question is that section 7 be agreed to. Are we agreed? The question is that section 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Agreed. Okay, and I think at this point we'll suspend um, until half past 10 and have a brief comfort break for everyone.
Welcome back, everybody. Um, I call Amendment 19 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 18 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. Call Amendment 21 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. I call Amendment 20 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not moved. The question is that Section 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Sections 10 to 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Call Amendment 102 in the name of Mary Fee in a group of its own. Mary Fee to move and speak to Amendment 102. Thank you, um, Convener. My amendment concerns the independent reviewer and the disclosure of information. Amendment 102 in Section 15 makes it clear that if an appeal to have information removed from a record is unsuccessful one time, then it does not rule out a further appeal if that same information is to be released at a later date. And this may seem like a small and insignificant amendment. However, I think it's vitally important that there is no doubt that someone has the opportunity to appeal again where there is a potential for information to be released. And I do think we need to be absolutely and completely clear on the face of the bill that if circumstances change, then this recourse is available to individuals. And I would um, urge the committee to support the amendment and I move it. Thank you. Other members wish to come in? Uh, thank you, Convener. Just to put on my record my support for Mary Fee's amendment here, I think it offers uh, further protection to people in regard to um, the disclosure of information, and I support the amendment. Okay. Minister. Thank you. Um, I appreciate and understand the uh, intention behind Mary Fee's amendment. However, as outlined in the government's response to the committee's stage one report, the independent reviewer makes a one-off decision for the purposes of that particular application. The reviewer's determination includes um, consideration of the reason the disclosure is being applied for and all of the other information that in the independent reviewer is able to take into account at the time. If the independent reviewer decides that the information should be de disclosed, this isn't a continuing decision, um, that it should be disclosed in relation to all subsequent applications any new application would be considered afresh. And if information about pre-12 behaviour was considered by the police to be relevant to the new application, um, and that information ought to be disclosed for the purpose of that new application, the independent reviewer would make a fresh decision. It therefore follows from this that the right to make an appeal to a sheriff would be available in relation to subsequent determinations, even if it concerns the same information. I share Mary Fee's aim to make um, to protect the rights of individuals in this process, particularly um, in relation to appeals, as I've outlined, but um, these are already protected in the measures already in the bill. And while our amendment's not needed to protect appeal rights, it has the potential to obscure the clarity of provision in section 15.4 of the bill that the sheriff's decision on an appeal against the interview independent reviewer's determination is final. If it's helpful, I'm happy to provide per further assistance that any guidance or guidelines provided for the operation of the independent reviewer's functions will address this matter and set out clearly how the law is intended to work in practice. I would hope that after hearing this explanation, Mary Fee will be satisfied and will not press her amendment. If she does so, I would ask members not to support it. Mary Fee to wind up and press her withdraal amendment one or two. Uh, thank you, con convener, and can I thank the minister for um, her, her comments. However, I, I do believe that we must be absolutely clear and, and explicit on um, the right of appeal. Uh, and, and I have a slight concern about some of the language that the minister used, uh, particularly things that ought to be addressed and should be considered, which is why I think my amendment is so important, because it leaves absolutely no doubt that the rights that individuals um, have and it will give complete and utter clarity and it won't, as the Minister um, alluded to in her comments, obscure clarity of, of rights for individuals um, and I will be pressing the amendment. Sorry Mary, can I ask you, to, you're pressing the I'm amendment? I'm pressing the amendment, Mary. Yeah. Okay, the question is that Amendment 102 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No. <laughs> um, 
the committee has not agreed, so there will be a division. Can I ask those in favour of the amendment to raise their hands, please? And those against the amendment? The result of the division is four for the amendment, three against the amendment, the amendment carries. The question is that section 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. The question is that section 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call amendment 95 in the name of the minister in a group on its own, minister to move and speak to amendment. Um, this amendment has been lodged in response to feedback from um, stakeholders to clarify the independence of the independent reviewer in the bill and to limit the extent of Scottish Minister's powers, which I'm sure is something the committee will welcome. This amendment makes clear that ministers may not use statutory guidance to be issued to the independent reviewer to direct him about uh, him or her about how to handle or deal with any specific review or reviews. I would urge committee members to support this amendment. Do any members wish to speak to this? Minister to wind up. Um, I, as I said, I hope everyone would see this as a positive step. It responds to concerns from stakeholders and clarifying the role of Scottish ministers to guidance. Um, and as such, I hope that the committee can support this amendment. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 95 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Yes, we are agreed. The question is that Section 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Agreed. <coughs> Excuse me. The question is that Sections 18 to 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 96 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 82. Minister to move formally. Formally moved. The question is that Amendment 96 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. I call Amendment 97 in the name of the Minister, already debated with Amendment 82. Minister to move formally. Moved. The question is that Amendment 97 be agreed to. <coughs> Are we all agreed? Yes. The question is that Section 21 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. And we'll suspend briefly to allow officials supporting the Minister to change places. Welcome back. I call Amendment 103 in the name of Oliver Mandel, grouped with amendments as shown in the groupings. Oliver Mandel to move Amendment 103 and speak to all amendments in the group. Thank you, uh, Convener. The amendments in this group are relatively simple uh, textual changes that would uh, give uh, us more confidence in Part 3. Uh, we're keen to talk uh, about actions as well as behaviour, because I think behaviour can often uh, be, be seen as being deliberate, uh, whereas I think uh, actions uh, tend to take a more factual approach. And I think from the point of view of victims, um, it's important to, to look at what, what's happened um, without, without always um, attributing, uh, attributing uh, blame. Um, and, and people want to know uh, what, what's happened. Uh, that's why they're often looking uh, for, for information. Um, in terms of uh, the other uh, amendments in the group that uh, inc in introduce uh, the concept of uh, distress, um, again, I, I think it makes it a, an easier uh, legal threshold uh, to reach. Uh, sometimes if uh, you're trying to establish harm, uh, that, that can be quite difficult, whereas I think distress it presents itself uh, more obviously, particularly in the case um, of vulnerable um, individuals. Um, and I, I don't think there's much further to add at this stage. Okay. Do any other members wish to come in on these amendments? No. Minister. Thank you. Um, thank you, <coughs> Oliver Mundell, for that helpful explanation of the intent behind these amendments. 
Within Section 22, we seek to balance the best interests of victims, including child victims, and the best interests of the child responsible for the harm, who remains the focus of the referral to the children's hearing system. I'm reassured that, as stated in the Stage 1 report, it was the view of the committee that the correct balance has been struck. Section 22 of the Bill already covers the provision of information in relation to offences committed by older children, as well as in relation to harmful behaviour by under 12s. So I'm not seeing the necessity for this amendment. However, since it doesn't materially alter the purpose of the section now, then I'm happy to accept Amendment 103. Turning to Amendment 104, 105, 107, 109, 112, 113, 114, 116, which are linked and are consequential, these amendments change the description of the behaviour of children under 12 by adding reference to how a child acted or make reference to actions in addition to how a child has behaved. Again, I am, I am satisfied that behaviour and the law's understanding of the interpretation of behaviour already captures actions and how someone has acted. So I don't really see the need for these amendments, but however, as at the same time they do not materially alter the intent or the effect of these sections, I'm happy again to accept them, should Mr Mundell insist on pressing them. Unfortunately, um, that is where I hope Mr Mundell's winning streak comes to a halt, because I can't accept Amendments 106 and 108. I hope that the committee will reject them once I have set out my reasoning. The amendments add distress as a wider description of the impact of the child's behaviour. That means that a person who is distressed or harmed by a child's behaviour may request information from the principal reporter. The policy intention is currently is to ensure that information that is shared about a child under the age of criminal responsibility is proportionate and justified. Therefore, the bill makes these powers available to the principal reporter only in serious cases, as described by section 179A. It is also the intention that harm already includes psychological harm caused by the behaviour of a child under 12. Amendment 106 expands the category of behaviour which is caught by Section 179A to include certain behaviours which cause distress or harm to another person. That would mean where there is no harm caused to a person by the behaviour, any distress caused to any other unspecified person by the behaviour would, be, would suffice to ensure that Section 179A applies. Amendment 108 amends section 1794B, which provides that a person harmed by the behaviour described in section 179A2 by a child under 12 could request information from the reporter. Amendment 108 would extend this provision to allow any person who is distressed or harmed by the behaviour of a child under 12 to request information from the principal reporter. It's not hard to see where we might all have concerns about the disproportionate sharing of information with persons far removed from the harm of the behaviour and the lessening of children's rights in favour of those unspecified persons who feel distressed by what a child may or may not have done. Currently, I believe we have the balance right between the rights of victims and their families and those of children who have engaged in seriously harmful behaviour and indeed their families. Indeed, that was also the view of the committee at stage one. Amendments 106 and 108 could result in an unjustified interference with a child's ECHR Article 8 rights. The disclosure of potentially sensitive information about a child is likely to be considered an interference with the child's Article 8 convention rights. The provisions in the bill ensure that this interference is proportionate by, amongst other things, restricting the list of individuals who can request the information. The significant expansion of this list that would be caused by Amendments 106 and 108 could result in a disproportionate interference with the Convention of the Rights of Child in question. There are also practical implications for the Victim Information Service. It's not clear how these amendments would impact on available resources, and it's easy to see how the service's resources could be diverted away from um, ensuring that those who most need information receive it timidly and effectively because of this much wider obligation um, to provide information. That would not be helpful in my view. 
I would therefore ask Mr Mundell not to place Amendment 106 and also not to move Amendment 108, which is consequential to Amendment 106 being agreed. If he insists, I would hope that the committee will reject the amendments. OK, Oliver Mundell, to wind up and um, press or withdraw Amendment 103. Thank you, uh, convener. I'm pleased uh, that the minister at least feels able to support uh, some of those amendments. I'm disappointed, however, uh, that uh, she doesn't think that those who are distressed uh, by uh, the harmful actions of others uh, deserve uh, any uh, right to request information, because that is all uh, these amendments at 106 and 108 do, is allow someone to make a request. It does not They don't speak to the nature of the information that should be provided. They don't speak uh, to whether or not that request should be accepted. They don't set any new rules um, in terms of the, the proportionality, uh, which, if uh, the Minister is very worried about that, then would suggest that the other uh, protections that are written into uh, this same section are, 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 are insufficient, uh, because these simply um, allow uh, people uh, to make a request, um, and that then has to be uh, decided and, and deliberated upon. Uh, so I would therefore uh, press the amendments because I think people do have a right uh, to request information. They don't necessarily have the right uh, to have that information provided, but I think they do have the right to make a request. So I press the amendments in my name. Okay. The question is that Amendment 103 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. <clears throat> I call Amendment 23 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not move. Call Amendment 22 in the name of Alec Cole Hamilton, already debated with Amendment 2. Alec Cole Hamilton to move or not move? Not move. I call Amendment 104 in the name of Oliver Mundell, already debated with Amendment 103. Oliver Mundell to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 104 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. I call Amendment 105 in the name of Oliver Mundell, already debated with Amendment 103. Oliver Mundell to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 105 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 106 in the name of Oliver Mundell, already debated with Amendment 103. Oliver Mundell to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 106 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Committee's not agreed, so there'll be a division. Can I ask those in favour of Amendment 106 to raise their hands, please? And those against Amendment 106? <coughs> the result of the division is for the Amendment 2, against the Amendment 5, the Amendment falls. Call Amendment 107 in the name of Oliver Mundell, already debated with Amendment 103. Oliver Mundell to move or not move? Move. <coughs> Excuse me. The question is that Amendment 107 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. I call Amendment 108 in the name of Oliver Mundell, already debated with Amendment 103. Oliver Mundell to move or not move? Uh, not moved as 106 has fallen. I call Amendment 109 in the name of Oliver Mundell, already debated with Amendment 103. Oliver Mundell to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 109 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. yes. Call Amendment 110 in the name of Oliver Mundell, grouped with Amendments 111 and 115. Oliver Mundell to move Amendment 110 and speak to all amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. Again, these are amendments that seek to improve uh, victims' uh, rights to information um, and uh, tighten up uh, the, 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 the uh, requirements on uh, the, the reviewer. Um, I think that it's important that there is a presumption that people uh, who are harmed uh, by uh, the actions or behaviour of children uh, should should have the right to, to information. Um, and I think that's a pretty simple uh, 
principle of, of, of justice. And I don't think that the fact that these actions will no longer be criminal means that people should have any less right uh, to, to information. Okay. Do any other members wish to speak to these amendments? Yeah, Minister. Thank you. Um, the reporter has a wide discretion to take independent decisions to disclose information where it's appropriate to do so. I am concerned that Amendment 110 will result in a disproportionate interference um, with the Article 8 Convention rights of the child and the independence of the reporter by creating a presumption that disclosure is always appropriate before the specific circumstances of the case are considered. Amendment 111 removes the principal reporter's ability to withhold information if it's not in the best interest of the child, responsible for the harm, or any other child involved in the case. It's not clear from the amendment why it would be appropriate to disclose information which would be detrimental to a child. I'm further concerned that the amendment displaces the balance of rights um, of the child responsible for the harm and the rights of the victim of the behaviour. Amendment 115 removes the ability of the principal reporter to consider other factors which may be appropriate when considering a request for information. That would mean that the reporter could only consider the factors listed in section 179C2A to D and could not consider any additional factors, even if they are directly relevant to the issue of disclosure. SCRA have um, advised that in any particular case there may be an additional factor that will mean it's not appropriate to provide information to the victim and I'm therefore concerned that this amendment would further limit the discretion of the reporter. The committee agreed that the bill currently strikes the correct balance between the best interests of both the child and victim. We need to recognise that we absolutely do recognise the need to support victims, to recognise the harm done to them and to respond to their needs. We've heard that victims want to ensure that no one else goes through what they have gone through. I'm very sympathetic to the concerns that the victims should be at the heart, you know, to the members' concerns that victims should be absolutely at the heart of our consideration of this reform. But I would suggest there's other ways of providing that focus that rather than opening up a disclosure regime which would have a very negative impact on the child who has offended. I would therefore ask the member to withdraw amendments 110, 111 and 115. Oliver Mundell to wind up and press or withdraw the amendments. Thank you, uh, convener. I, I, I don't find the arguments that the minister makes convincing. I think it is right uh, to limit the discretion uh, of uh, the, the uh, rev reviewer or reporter because I think that these uh, are rights that, that, that victims have. I think we can't just be seen to put the best interests of the child uh, before a victim's right to information uh, whilst uh, the, the, the general uh, tone of the bill as, as introduced uh, did seek to strike that balance. I think these uh, particular amendments which are in relation to victims' information only I uh, should put the interests of victims first um, and that there does have to be some balance and protection uh, but we think that the, uh, the criteria set out on the face of the bill uh, provide a sufficient opportunity and that there shouldn't be, uh, there sh there shouldn't be any need uh, to look at factors beyond that. Okay. The question is that Amendment 110 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. no. Committee's not agreed so there will be a division. Can I ask those in favour of the amendment to raise their hands, please? And those against the amendment? The result of the division is for the amendment two, against the amendment five, the amendment falls. I call amendment 111 in the name of Oliver Mundell, already debated with amendment 110, Oliver Mundell to move or not move? Move. Question is that Amendment 111 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. no. The committee is not agreed, so there will be a division. Can I ask those in favour of the amendment to raise their hands, please? And those against the amendment? The result of the division is for the amendment two, against the amendment five, the amendment therefore falls. 
I call Amendment 112 in the name of Oliver Mundell, already debated with Amendment 103. Oliver Mundell to move or not move. Move. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 112 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 113 in the name of Oliver Mundell, already debated with Amendment 103. Oliver Mundell to move or not move. Move. The question is that Amendment 113 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. I call Amendment 111 in the name of Oliver Mundell. Already... 114. Thank you. <laughs> amendment 114 in the name of Oliver Mundell. Already debated with Amendment 103. <coughs> Oliver Mundell to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 114 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? I call Amendment 115 in the name of Oliver Mundell, already debated with Amendment 110. Oliver Mundell to move or not move? Move. The question is that Amendment 115 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. Committee's not agreed, so there'll be a division. Can I ask those in favour of the amendment to raise their hands, please? And those against the amendment? <coughs> The result of the division is for the amendment two, against the amendment five, the amendment falls. I call amendment 116 in the name of Oliver Mundell, already debated with amendment 103. Oliver Mundell to move or not move? Move. The question is that amendment 116 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. <coughs> I call Amendment 117 in the name of Oliver Mundell and a group on its own. Oliver Mundell to move and speak to Amendment 117. Uh, thank you, uh, Convener. This amendment uh, relates to the duty on the principal reporter to make a report in cases of loss of life. Uh, I believe these are the most uh, serious cases uh, which uh, are likely to be subject uh, to victim um, information requests. Uh, but more than that, I think uh, we are... Uh, there are cases involving a loss of life. There is a wider uh, public interest um, and it's important uh, that uh, we investigate what, what's happened uh, and the particular circumstances. Um, and I think that there should be um, an automatic uh, report uh, made available uh, to inform uh, both uh, Scottish Government ministers uh, and uh, the Lord Advocate, as well as uh, families, what, what's happened in those instances. Um, the actual content of, of such report would be subject to, to, to uh, further uh, regulation. Uh, but I think it's an important principle uh, that we would have uh, an explanation of what had happened uh, where the, someone had, had died. Okay, thank you. Um, any other members wishing to come in? Yeah. Gail Ross. Um, I thank, um, thank you, Convener. I just want to... Um, ask Oliver Mundell, maybe I've uh, I missed it, but I don't remember taking any evidence on this particular issue and I don't believe it was included in our stage one report either and I just wanted some clarification on where this has come from. Um, it's a very, very valid point um, from uh, Gail Ross, but there are a number of amendments that have been brought forward that there hasn't been specific uh, evidence uh, taken on. Um, in my view, uh, looking um, at part uh, three of the bill as a whole, I, I think this is an important uh, protection uh, for victims. And I think sometimes it's important to put uh, these things on the face of the bill. And I wouldn't want uh, these serious cases, which we did um, in part hear about from uh, the law officers when they were here. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think we would want uh, those sort of offences uh, to result in a situation where uh, victims, but also uh, those who've uh, got overall responsibility uh, for the safety of people in this country not to know uh, what, what had happened. Alec I, I support absolutely the provisions in the bill that make um, or give victims or those affected by uh, harmful behaviour information as to getting to the bottom of what happened. Um, I think there is provision enough within the bill for that uh, to, have, to make it the norm that a report is produced de facto after loss of life, I think, runs the risk of... I will. Um, I, I think uh, to say that it's the norm 
um, or, or de facto for, for a loss of life to occur in that age group. You know, looking at, at the relative occurrence of these, you know, would suggest that this is something that would be used you know, in a small number of cases. But again, I think we'd add additional reassurance uh, for victims, for members of the public, um, and, and uh, for, for those, as I say, responsible for uh, public safety. Nevertheless, I, I understand, and, and obviously I've lent on the very small number of cases in this bracket myself in, in my earlier remarks. However, I, I think that if there is a duty on a principal reporter to make a, a report in, in any situation where there is a loss of life, it, become, it will be the norm. Um, it runs the risk of exposing that child to... Um, Further, inf uh, th further attention or a stigma attached, which might follow them through the rest of their life. So, for that reason, I can't support this amendment. Yeah, thanks. Just to come back in, I mean, I am interested in, in what this amendment will do. Um, I just wonder if the minister is um, happy to give consideration to this um, in advance of stage three of her feelings. Okay, if all members, any other members wishing to come in, I will bring the minister in. But Okay, Minister. Thank you. Um, thank you, Oliver Mundell, for explaining the purpose and intent of uh, his amendment um, 117. Throughout the bill process, we have all been aware of the need to provide for the potential of very serious harmful behaviour by a tiny number of children below the age of criminal responsibility. And currently, as we've said, we know that these offences are extremely rare and thankfully so. We do need mechanisms in place to allow for such behaviour in the event that it happens in future to be appropriately investigated and addressed. I understand, therefore, the aim um, of what Oliver Mundell is trying to achieve within this amendment, but it doesn't do that, I would say. It's not clear um, what purpose such a statutory requirement for such a report would serve. My officials have had preliminary discussions with um, SCRA in respect of this issue, and um, I understand that in cases in where there is loss of life, where the child was below the age of criminal responsibility by the, the principal reporter, um, would brief ministers in those circumstances. That would seem appropriate to me. In addition to this, the Lord Advocate has responsibility in Scotland to investigate any death which requires further explanation, which includes all sudden, suspicious, accidental and unexplained deaths. Again, that seems appropriate to me. I'm struggling to see why we would need another statutory reporting mechanism and how that could be achieved without cutting across um, these existing responsibilities and practices. Now, clearly, if a child has been involved in behaviour which has resulted in the most serious harm to another person, that requires a wide range of agencies, including Scottish ministers, to consider um, what happened, how it happened, what's being done to address that, and what the role of public and statutory agencies was in the lives of, of those involved in such an incident. Crucially, we, and vitally important for victims, we would want to work out how we might prevent something similar happening again in future and take steps to intervene to address the harm that's occurred as well as to prevent future harm. I think as Minister for Children and Young People with wider responsibilities around protecting children from harm, I'll take this matter away and consider it more fully and I undertake to do so. Certainly. Yeah, I, I'm just wondering, uh, Minister, just based on what you said there, if you can confirm, as it currently stands, if there was to be a tragic and a unfortunate situation where there was a loss of life as a result of behaviour of somebody under the age of criminal responsibility, the Lord Advocate could still review that that death as it stands just now. That's what you're saying. Certainly, as I said, the Lord Advocate has responsibility in Scotland to investigate any death which requires further explanation, uh, which includes all sudden... <coughs> suspicious, accidental and unexplained deaths, and that to me seems appropriate. I am, as I said, far from convinced that a statutory reporting duty as set out in this amendment is the right way to address this issue. I would therefore ask Mr Mundell not to press this amendment, and if he does, I would ask the committee to resist it. Oliver Mundell to wind up and press or withdraw the amendment. Um, I thank uh, the Minister for the explanation of her provision, but uh, sadly, I don't think that a briefing to uh, ministers is adequate uh, for uh, families uh, of those who've lost a loved one. Uh, furthermore, the points that she makes in relation to the Lord Advocate's 
duties, um, a, a, a death that, that, that has taken place as a result of the action of another that's been subject to, uh, that, that has been subject uh, to uh, the, the children's hearing procedure, I don't think would count as, as being unexplained and requiring further uh, information. Just, if you're wishing to intervene, you need to do it through the chair. Okay. Sorry, Oliver. I'm happy to take an intervention. Right. Sorry, it's, it's been just, uh, an intervention right next to you. Um, I'm just wondering, now, based on what you're saying there, um, Oliver Mundell, if, um, if you're suggesting that the current arrangements is explained by the Minister for what the Lord Advocate can do, uh, you're not satisfied with those and you don't think that they're adequate, <coughs> and the, the Lord Advocate, as we've heard, can investigate any death, sudden or suspicious? I'm, I'm very satisfied with those current arrangements for, for, for the purposes that they're intended, and that is to investigate uh, deaths that, that, that require a further explanation. Uh, what, those, uh, what those powers don't currently do is allow uh, the, the Lord Advocate to, or in this circumstance, I don't think allow the Lord Advocate uh, to examine what had happened in a case that had been determined uh, by the children's hearing system. This bill, um, particularly in light of the rejection uh, of my previous amendment removes uh, the Lord Advocate from making consideration uh, of, of, of the actions of children uh, younger than uh, younger than 12. And I, but I think in terms of that maintaining broader uh, confidence uh, in the prosecution system and otherwise, the Lord Advocate should still know uh, what's going on where uh, one citizen in this country takes uh, the life uh, of another. Um, and uh, furthermore, uh, there is a third uh, part to uh, section uh, to, to, to 1B I I uh, or 1B uh, which is I I I uh, where a prescribed relative uh, would have access to that information. Both of the uh, points that the minister makes relate to purely the, the Scottish government or the, the prosecution's uh, services interest. I think that a, pres a relative uh, would expect uh, a written uh, confirmation of what had happened uh, where they've lost a loved one. And I think uh, this, uh, having a statutory provision strengthens the bill. Um, I'm happy if it's rejected to look at uh, anything the Minister wants to bring forward at stage three, but for now, uh, I would like to press. Okay. The question is that Amendment 117 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. no. Committee's not agreed, so there'll be a division. Can I ask those in favour of the amendment to raise their hands, please? And those against the amendment. The result of the division is for the amendment two, against the amendment five, and the amendment falls. I call amendment 118 in the name of Oliver Mundell in a group on its own. Oliver Mundell to move and speak to amendment 118. Uh, thank you, uh, convener. This is a section that would uh, create a duty on the principal reporter uh, to produce an annual report um, outlining an overall picture um, of uh, the offences uh, covered in section 1791A1AII. I think that this will be uh, useful information uh, for parliamentarians uh, and for the government uh, when uh, monitoring uh, this area in the future. Alec Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Convener. I was torn on this amendment, I have to say. I thought initially um, it would help my and others' causes in terms of advancing the uh, argument to increase the age of criminal responsibility still further by showing through Parliament, obviously that means it's in the public domain, um, that that offending of this nature is microscopic amongst the, the sort of age groups we're talking about. However, it also then occurred to me that if you put something in the public domain, you lose control of it. And as, as such, those um, elements of the press that might have a dimmer view of further increase in age of criminal responsibility would focus on the egregious nature of the very limited but very severe nature of offences that a very, very small handful of children were committing. And, and that would concentrate the public minds around that rather than the, the small extent of those crimes. So, to that end, I will not support this amendment. Do any other members wish to speak? Mary Fee. Th thank you, Convener. I mean, very briefly, I mean, I, I um, too have a, a great deal of sympathy with the amendment that um, Oliver Mundell ha has lodged, but I share the same concerns that Alex Cole Hamilton has, has just um, 
expressed, and I'm not sure if there is a way to do a report that would minimise the impact that, that Alex Cole Hamil Hamilton is, is talking about, and if there was the, a way to um, script an amendment that would give us more information without causing the damage, I would be happy to support it. But the way the amendment is drafted at the moment, I cannot, I cannot support it. Okay. Uh, Minister. Um, thank you very much. I understand the rationale behind what Oliver Mundell is asking for here, and just as I appreciate the thinking behind the other amendments laid, which seek reporting mechanisms to enable monitoring of changes um, being introduced in the Bill and of its measures, but I have two concerns. One general on the amendments around reporting to date, and one specific in relation to Amendment 118. In relation to Amendment 118, I share the committee members' concerns to ensure that we get the balance right for victims and their families. <coughs> Clearly, the bill is introducing an important new responsibilities and opportunities for information to be shared by SCRA with victims in the most serious cases. And of course, it would be really important to monitor this change. I believe that the information, um, such information would assist SCRA's work with Victim Support Scotland and its other key partners on the guidance which it's developing on the types of information to be shared under Section 22 of the Bill and on the broader work required to support and respond to victims. But Amendment 118 is effectively asking the Scottish Children's Reporter Administration to duplicate the statutory duty which they already exist to publish an annual report of its performance. I think what we want to ensure is that the information that we need to monitor the changes is being collated. Now, members will be aware that a group made up of key organisations and partners has already been set up to consider matters relating to victims, and I'll ensure that this group considers this issue and how best to achieve the intention behind this amendment in advance of Stage 3 of the Bill. I will also give further consideration to what more we might do to support victims, including through the appropriate provision of information to them. I'd be happy to update the committee before Stage 3 on that. On the general point about around reporting requirements, my concern is that we have an inconsistent approach with some of the key aspects being monitored and, and others not being monitored. And I think we need to take a very strategic approach to collating and monitoring and reporting on changes and measures in this bill. Um, I would be happy to look at what amendments are needed in that regard um, and what could be introduced at stage three. I would hope that that's acceptable to Mr Mundell and I would ask him not to press this amendment. If he insists, I would ask the committee to resist it on the basis that I intend to consider more generally what reporting measures might be useful to include the bill in the bill through amendments potentially at stage three. Oliver Mundell to wind up and press or withdraw amendment 118, please. Thank you, uh, convener. I'm, I'm happy to accept the minister's reassurances that she'll look again at this aspect of the bill at stage three. However, I do object to the specific criticisms raised by uh, other members and the minister because I think, again, the idea that we wouldn't uh, provide clarity on, on what's going on here to the public on the basis that it might be distorted uh, by some aspects of the media is, pretty, is a pretty astonishing uh, su suggestion uh, because I think that uh, the public parliamentarians uh, I'd otherwise have a, have a right to know uh, what's happening um, in, in, in uh, all aspects um, of uh, our, our, our system. Um, and I think that these amendments are in the interests of uh, transparency. Um, and I'd hope that at least uh, when it comes to outlining the number of cases uh, where behaviour has taken place and uh, where the information um, has been provided, uh, where information has been provided, uh, does does get picked up in, in any reviewing uh, mechanism. But I'm happy to, to to not press the amendment for now. Okay, thank you. So the question is that section 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? agreed. Yes. <coughs> okay, that concludes stage two consideration of the bill for today. The deadline for amendments to all remaining sections of the bill is 12 noon tomorrow. Can I thank Minister uh, Mary Todd and her officials? Um, the committee will next meet on Thursday, the 7th of February, where we will be continuing stage two consideration of the Age of Criminal Responsibility Scotland Bill. We'll now move into private session. <laughs>